My name is Marcia Robinson, and we are recording an oral history with Adolf Greenberg and George Esper as part of the Sweet Mummeries Oral History Project. This project commemorates the 50th anniversary of the Miami University Middletown campus. This interview is taking place on May 11, 2017 in the Gardner Harvey Library. Professors Greenberg and Espert, do I have your permission to begin this interview? Yes, yes. Thank you. Could you tell us how you came to the Miami Middletown campus? What brought you here? Well, why don't you start with that? <laughs> I, had, um, I had just finished up, let me step back a little bit. Uh, I'm a graduate of Miami University. I have a baccalaureate and I have a master's from Miami. And I did my PhD work at Wayne State University in Detroit. And part of my responsibilities or obligations uh, for a PhD in anthropology and cultural anthropology was um, ethnographic field work. So I had just completed two years of um, ethnographic field work in the uh, Canadian subarctic with Cree and, and what's called Anishinaabe or Ojibwe Indians, uh, Indian communities, Indian bands. And um, I was offered two jobs, uh, one here and one at Wayne State. And uh, living in Detroit for a couple years cured me on any interest in urban life. And so uh, we came to um, went back to Miami, and I started teaching courses. And I was, that's how it worked out. What year was that? Uh, 73, 74, something like that. I don't remember it then. Oh, okay. Yeah. George, when did you get here and what brought you here? I came to Miami, Oxford, in 1979, and Dolph brought me to this campus to teach adjunct courses. So I was teaching in Oxford full time and then teaching mm -hmm. courses here for a number of years. And then eventually in 1995, I was on this campus exclusively. So the courses that you teach do not fit with the idea of Bunny Hollow Tech, which is what some people refer to this campus <laughs> lovingly as. Um, how did you introduce this curriculum to the Middletown community? Well, let me provide you with a little bit of a larger context. Um, the, the nature of this campus um, was that you had uh, offices uh, that were occupied by uh, members, single members of departments, all right? Uh, you did not have, with some exceptions, uh, you did not have full departments represented here. You had one or two people. And they all occupied the same space. And they met in the faculty lounge together and so on. And the thing that I discovered about this campus um, very early on, and I, and I relish it to this day because it was such a wonderful thing, was that there was an intense intellectual curiosity. People were receptive to ideas. They were aggressive about it. They were less concerned about promotion and tenure, and they were more concerned about uh, the kind of intellectual platform that they were going to provide for their students and for their own growth. And uh, so we had just um, extraordinary discussions. We had, um, uh, you know, a wonderful repartee between faculty and other faculty members and faculty and students and so on. And uh, so the cross-cultural perspective that, that cultural anthropologists, anthropologists would bring to it was readily accepted. And they, uh, and I think they, uh, and there was a good hunger for it. And I thought that was uh, a great thing. So this campus, in that regard, this campus um, was set up for that, but it also had, you know, a, just a wonderful set of people that, in, in the social sciences, you had Jim Lehman in history, who was just wonderful. He was a Harvard grad. Uh, he was also um, uh, blackballed during the McCarthy era. Um, you had, uh, who was, Jim was very liberal. You had Ray Fenning, who was fundamentally a, a conservative, um, a conservative with some integrity, and um, uh, and yet there was a, a wonderful ebb and flow in, in the way in which we were able to exchange ideas. We 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 did some uh, we did faculty colloquia, 
Uh, in fact, I established that here when I got here and where faculty members were able to do, um, uh, give presentations on areas of interest to them and so on, in which uh, faculty and students were invited to uh, attend. And that was fairly successful and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. So the campus itself was, was, I was so happy to be here in that regard because it wasn't just talking to other anthropologists. It wasn't, you know, it was, it were historians just talking to historians and so on. Uh, you really had a, an interdisciplinary um, mode of existence here way before the university uh, discovered it. Uh, and, and I think that was remarkable. That's what made this place very special to me. Well, I had a similar experience much later in time. Uh, and the faculty lounge was a center of a lot of discussion, activity, uh, and the interdisciplinary part oh. was, was really something that I didn't find on the Oxford campus. No. But here I would sit down to lunch and I'd be talking to a psychologist, somebody in theater, somebody in the English department, right. and so on. So there were a lot of, a lot of opportunities for cross-fertilization. Did this um, intellectual environment affect your research or your teaching? It's hard to sort that out. Yeah. Uh, ideas come and ideas go, and you hear an idea that eventually works its way into part of what you're doing in the classroom. So, yeah, I think it's important as, as we grow, we draw on some of those conversations that we hear from other people. We could use other faculty as sounding boards, which we often did in the faculty lounge. We had an, we had an idea about something we wanted to talk about in the classroom and so on, and uh, uh, you, can, you could fly by them. Just in a normal course of, of discussion we would have over coffee. And, um, uh, but in terms, as George pointed out, I mean, it's pretty hard to kind of sort that out a little bit. Um, I think the, the environment here was very conducive to doing a lot of creative things in the classroom. Um, and I think that was important. And I think, uh, and that's, that's the way the faculty were, were situated intellectually and in their careers. And something else I think is important here. We were also dealing with non-traditional age students. All right? And that is um, uh, extremely important because what you have here was a lot of people that were number one were paying for their own education, you know, were working for a living, all right, um, and were had an insatiable appetite to learn and 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 improve themselves uh, in many ways. And I found that kind of perspective where you did have you did have the 18 year old in class. But you also had the person that was retired, a person that was, uh, you know, middle-aged, bringing all of that accumulated wisdom to the classroom, and that helped everybody out. You know, that that you can that's that's invaluable, no question in my mind. And another point on the discussions in the faculty lounge, yeah. uh, expressing our points of view to people in other disciplines and getting the kind of response that we would get from them, that was also energizing. Yeah. Because we're not talking just to our own colleagues in our own discipline, but we're hearing what kind of feedback we get from people in other disciplines. So that's really a broadening effect. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the, the classroom uh, <laughs> population, the, the demographics of the, of the classroom with People who are raising children and having their perspectives and their points of view, and then the 18-year-olds who are hearing it from somebody besides the professor in the front of the classroom. They're hearing from other students and hearing the kinds of experiences that they, they're, they're having. The planning committee for this campus hoped for an education that was more than technical. Mm -hmm. They wanted a liberal arts mm -hmm. experience for the children and the adults of this community. How did you help this diverse community of students understand what your 
fields contribute to their overall education? Well, the one thing that I found especially important, I think, is that in teaching courses about American Indian nations, which both Dolph and I were doing, uh, we were teaching a lot of students who were in education. And they were going to be going into the classroom uh, and either perpetuating the stereotypes and the myths that are so prevalent in our own society or getting a more realistic perspective that they could pass on to their students. So it was a way of perpetuating the reality information that we were presenting to students. And that was interesting because sometimes we get students coming back and saying, <laughs> well, I went into right. the classroom doing my student teaching and I started talking about <laughs> oh, yeah. and then the antiquated teacher in the classroom was, wait, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there were some conflicts that came up and students were seeing the difference in their two perspectives between what we were offering them and what, what the traditional stereotypes yeah, we, we could, and, we, and all of our anthro courses, we always talk about um, culture. We talk about cultural relativity, which was very critical. You have to look at things in the context in which they are found. And that's, that's, a, um, that's a sea change in thinking for a lot of students, I think, once they get in contact with that and to understand the fallacies of ethnocentrism. Uh, also understand why people are ethnocentric, but also why when you take it afield, when you start using that as a basis to compare and talk about other people, then it becomes fallacious. Uh, those are very important fundamental concepts. And we have always felt in Anthro that once you get these things through and you understand the fallacy of racism and you understand those things, um, then uh, you've, you've, you've made a quantum leap uh, in things. Uh, was it always successful? No, I don't think so, but it was I think that's, in a large measure, in terms of our curriculum, these are things that we, we could hang our hat on and feel very comfortable about. Yeah. And I think we generated quite a few majors for being a small department. Right. And they came from students who were able to grasp things like cultural relativity, mm -hmm. that they could understand that and take that mindset into other areas. Right. And we were always concerned about, well, okay, if you want to be an anthropology major, what are you going to do with it? And what we found students doing was totally predictable for us. Uh, might be a bank teller, might be working in some of their industry, but they had a perspective that their colleagues in their work did not have. So they understood the cross-cultural perspective that anthropology offers, and they were able to use that. Sometimes we find students need to learn not just by hearing a lecture, but also they need to learn by hands-on experience or taking trips. Mm -hmm. Did you have any student trips to help reinforce what you were teaching in the classroom? Well, I have one story that I think is kind of interesting. I was driving on the country one time and I found a raccoon that had been hit by a car, but it wasn't flattened, it was really in good shape. So I threw it in the back Apart of my from truck. Being dead. It really was dead. <laughs> it was dead. I threw it in the back of my truck and I was teaching an introductory anthropology course at the time. And students are always interested in the uh, archaeological array of tools. And one of the tools that's commonly talked about are scrapers. Mm -hmm. Well we had a scraper in our inventory. And so I brought the rac I, I skinned the raccoon out and I left the body of the raccoon elsewhere. But I brought the, the skin into the classroom uh, and I brought out a scraper and I said, okay, this is what you have to do here. And one student absolutely would not touch it. She had no part of it. Other students got into it to varying degrees. And one student was having probably the most difficult in the class really got into it and she didn't want to stop. She was going to, she was going to scrape that hide until it was ready to be tanned. Uh, but we could do that in anthropology. We, we could bring in those kinds of experiences. I had, um, I taught a course on food and culture and I, I, I was able to obtain some uh, bear meat squirrel 
Um, what else did I get? I got some venison and a bunch of other meats and so on. And, and we talked about paleo diets and things of that sort. And I cooked them out here at a barbecue. Uh, and then we had the students eat this, right? We had sat down and had a, had a uh, paleo dinner and it was very interesting. It was fun to do that. We also had, a, we had an atlatl that one of my students had fabricated and brought it in and a spear thrower and uh, used to take that out and throw it into the signs of the campus basically and I was kind of not invited to do that again. But it was very interesting to see the kind of torque you could get with, this, with an atlatl. It was really remarkable. Field trips, we did field trips. Um, I did several um, uh, to the various um, uh, um, archaeological sites in the area, culturally, cultural historic sites in the area. Uh, Mount City National Monument and all those, Sipe Mound and Serpent Mound and Fort Hill and Fort Ancient and all those. We took students up to Amish country with the proviso that uh, no, fo no photographs because of um, uh, the Amish concern about photography and the kind of invasive technology that that, that is. And um, what else did we do? We, oh, we went all over the place. And, uh, and that was important and that was, that was a lot of fun. And we did that usually on a Saturday. And uh, students um, got up for that. They were excited about it. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was exhausting, but it was a lot of fun. Students are always interested in archaeological artifacts. Right. And I commented to students that, boy, they're all over the place. You can <laughs> just go into a farm field and find artifacts. Mm -hmm. So we did. Uh, especially after a rain, they're more visible. Right. And, and they never realized that all these stones that they're finding <laughs> all over the field are really artifacts. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't looking for a tool per se, but a piece of stone that had been worked in the process of making a tool, and they're out here. I mean, there, were, there was such a large population right. in the area that you don't have to go on a hunt for an arrow point. You can find these tools everywhere, and you get a better sense of what constitutes the archaeological record that way, too. It's not just points and, and arrowheads and the common knowledge of, of artifacts. Talk about the mechanics of doing a field trip. Um, what kind of paperwork? What kind of permissions did you have to do? How did you fund the, the van uh, and the gasoline? I would go down and I would talk to the then executive director, Jean Bennett, the first executive director of this campus, who was a wonderful administrator, uh, one of the best people I've ever worked for. Um, I said, Jean, you know, I want to take a field trip. Uh, I'll take X number of students and so on. He'd say, what do you need? And I said, I need a, a couple vans and fuel and so on, a university credit card. He said, well, I'll get it for you. Goodbye. That's the way it operated. Right? There was no issues with yeah. litigation and, and you know, concern over you know, um, safety issues and the like. Uh, off we went. And it, was, it was easy. And uh, because he never got in our way, you know, he trusted the faculty to do the, the good things, the right things, and, um, and he, he liked that, and I liked it, and our students liked it. So, so if that's what you're asking, that's, that's the kind of, um, it's, it's, it's right now, it's, I, would be, I would imagine it's much, much harder, and I wouldn't probably even contemplate doing a trip because of all of the nonsense you would have to go through, all right. Are there any stories about students, <laughs> nameless students, who were taking advantage of the opportunity to get an education? Can you recall what some of the obstacles may have been? What did they overcome? I, oh, well, I mean, I, uh, students, single, Single mothers that are now attorneys, um, student that um, uh, got a PhD in English, um, uh, one who's a um, um, a physician, uh, probably more than one is a physician, uh, several undergraduate school, 
we did very well by our students in terms of, of, of their, if that's the question you're asking, I, the students really overcame a lot because they were maintaining a household, they were either a single parent or they had other obligations or they had a job in order to maintain themselves and their families. And for them to be able to do the things that they did, uh, you had to admire. I mean, it was just so wonderful. I mean, it was, and we encouraged that. We encouraged them to, uh, to, to seek out their dreams and so on. Um, and that, that was a, a, a nice legacy, I think, so for, um, for the faculty in this campus as well. I mean, everybody was working in that in concert. An informal measure that I used to always just kind of use for myself. What are the con what, what condition are the cars in the parking lot? <laughs> and there were times when they were all pretty rugged looking, rusty cars <laughs> and old cars that were just barely able to run. And that's, I think, when we had our best students. Yeah. When the cars got to be nicer, newer <laughs> cars. I, I think this is just a personal opinion. It seemed to be less intense of an interest in what they were doing educationally. That's this is way beyond thinking like an old fogey. I mean, he was it was spot on. I mean, it's just the way that, that the cars and the modes of transportation, and a lot of students took buses here. I mean, they, they remember that? Yeah. They would oh, have yeah. to, yeah. you know, they, they had no other way of, of transportation. They had to take several connecting buses. I think it was amazing. For students looking at this interview in about 10 or 15 <laughs> years, after we've had four-year degrees mm -hmm. at regional crisis for a long time, mm -hmm. Would you please explain to that future audience what goes along with a rusty car? Just to be very clear, what is the cultural anthropology of rusty cars? Well, there's obviously an economic factor. Uh, students who can't afford the better cars go to Oxford now and you, go, you can find a Maserati here and there. Uh, never found cars like that on this campus. These are students who were struggling, but committed to getting an education. And the car was just the best they had for getting to the campus to do what they needed to do. It was, it was, it was practicality over image. And, uh, and, and that, that had to, I think, uh, uh, saturate the way in which they went about the business of, of getting an education and and fulfilling their dreams and so on. And, uh, and that's how I would look at it. We've had a few stories about toddlers and children on campus, whether they were the children of faculty or of students. Do you recall any children in the classroom or in the hallways? <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know that I can think of anything specific, but I. Yeah, Having some, a parent bring a child to class. That was not, that's not, yeah. You know. Usually ask, is it okay? You know, I couldn't get a sitter tonight or whatever. And it always worked out fine. I had no problems with that whatsoever. I had students mm -hmm. bring, their, bring their kids in and, and they were fine. And uh, if they were, uh, the kids got a little bit raucous and so on, there was no problem with that. I'd go down and talk with them. And, but it wasn't chastising, it was just a matter of, you know, uh, it's what it is. No problem. If you had said no, what would have happened? I, well, I wouldn't have. I can't imagine. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have said no. I wouldn't no. have done it. Why would I exclude somebody on that basis? I wouldn't do it. <laughs> we both have kids, so we know what it's like to right. be raising kids and doing what you have to do. And just <laughs> normal course of events. <laughs> You mentioned um, Mr. Lehman yeah. and his perspective on politics. Um, I think we have some stories about soldiers and veterans and wars, whether it's the Vietnam War or mm -hmm. the Gulf War. Um, do you have stories about veterans in the classroom? Uh, well, just trying to think. Um, or protest on campus. They were able to, I mean, the, the veterans that were in the classroom, and there were several, 
um, were able to speak to things and they felt, uh, and if we were dealing with a topic that was timely and, and probably would resonate with their, their experience, um, uh, they would uh, participate in the discussion. It wasn't, I would, you would never push them, if you knew that they were a veteran, you would never push them to relate things because for many they don't want to talk about those kinds of things, and understandably so. Um, but uh, they, they, they glean some wisdom by being put in harm's way and, um, uh, and some were willing to share it and, um, and some did not want to talk about it and that was quite all right. I don't know what else to hmm. No. Once those students came to campus by bus, yeah. they might be here all day. Yeah. For a long day. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. What did they do in between classes? Well, they would hang out in the office. They would study. And uh, um, I don't know what the... Hang out in the commons area, talk yeah, to other students. Yeah, they... they, and, oh. and, they and actually, those days, I mean, they weren't sitting in front of a computer screen. So what you would have, and this is really one of the great things that's missing these days, I think, more than ever, is... Um, uh, discussions across the table about topics in the classroom where there was that beautiful repartee that, that and you could learn, you could question each other, you could challenge each other and so on about what's going on rather than having your nose into a, a computer screen. Uh, you know, you were, you were actually talking about sharing your knowledge as you understood it with somebody else and you had that kind of discussion and that was a really great thing about the commons and before computers came on the scene. Um, uh, I miss that. Yeah. Yeah, relationships. Yeah. A lot of, right. a lot of involvement right. with students in relationships and conversations and discussions. And, um, yeah, the, the computer world and the iPhone. Did anybody ever talk about the, um, the students we had from the Lebanon Correctional Facility? Just that they were here, one student said they liked playing um, billiards. <laughs> yeah, I think I played billiards with some of them. Um, they, were in, they were an interesting group. I mean, they, they used to bring them over and kind of like release them in here. And uh, many of them showed up for class and some didn't. And, uh, uh, but uh, some interesting animated discussions we had with, with, with that group. So um, about, I mean, about uh, circumstances that got them into trouble and, uh, and, and, you know, the mistakes that they had made and so on. And then they, uh, but they also asked some interesting questions about uh, social relationships, cultural context, and things of that sort. Uh, probably uh, in some measure from their experience in, at the uh, in the institution. All right. Okay. Did either of you advise any student organizations? Yeah. Social Science Club. Well, I was an advisor to Social Science Club. All right. What was that? Just social science students. Anybody was taking. Uh, or anybody was interested, actually, but people that were taking uh, sociology, anthropology, history, political science, um, what did I miss? Psychology, and they would be, um, and they would have some small events or sp speakers and so on, and we would um, uh, have some noontime, uh, lunchtime uh, discussions. Remember the time we had that pizza? It was just absolutely wretched. <laughs> yeah, now you remember. All right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Students were pitching this pizza from someplace in town. I think it's closed now. It should have been. We won't uh, name it. We won't name it. But, uh, yeah, we had <laughs> pretty wretched. But um, the Social Science Club sponsored some events and helped out when we had speakers on campus and so on. Did you talk about all the American? We didn't talk about that yet. We should talk about yeah. that. Please do. Well, uh, Hanson Lecture. When, when Dolph got me over to this campus 
on a full-time basis. We started expanding uh, courses on American Indians. Uh, and we also brought in a lot of people, uh, well-known American Indian leaders, like Winona LaDuke, I think a name that most people know. She spoke on this campus. Uh, Tim Gallego. Uh, Charlene Teeters. Charlene uh, Teeters, Orrin Lyons. Orrin Lyons, <clears throat> Regis Pecos, Ted Hohola, who else? These are all very prominent American Indian leaders, figures, all right. Um, and this was under the auspices of the Hanson Anthropology Lecture Series, who my academic godfather, George Fathauer, established um, upon his retirement. And then um, a few years after that, I was put in charge of it until I retired, basically. Uh, and George and I, basically, we, we, when we were thinking about speakers and so on, we were uh, intent on bringing uh, American Indian voices to that forum rather than somebody who's a non-native talking about natives, a classic anthropology or history and doing those things without um, having any connection to those communities. And so we were able to bring in uh, some very special people to talk about a whole range of ac issues like the Redskin issue, gaming issues on reservations, um, the um, the need to uh, for sustainable futures and what American Indian communities can show, um, a whole host of things. That were brought. And these were always, we brought them over to this campus, and they were at, uh, they were they filled the classrooms. Um, I mean, we had bunches uh, in in the classroom, uh, and uh, they would also give lectures over at uh, in Oxford as well to large numbers of, of uh, people. And so it was a very, very, it was a once a year. And, uh, and George, of course, had all of these, a lot of connections through his work with the National Park Service and, uh, and work with the Pueblos. And um, uh, so we were able to really connect with um, some incredible people to have on campus. It was wonderful. The Hanson Lecture Series was supposed to bring speakers to Oxford, but we worked together to see that we could Get them here for an extra day, some additional funding, and make them a feature on this campus. Um, and I remember when one of the speakers was here, uh, people from the public relations office were going to come in, catch a couple photographs, and then leave. Uh, she never left. She said, I never heard such a spellbinding speaker before. And it was somebody who was presenting what it's like to be an American Indian. and. Uh, presenting their story. So it was really, uh, we both think that it was really a very strong uh, addition to the education about American Indian students, American Indian people rather. And we need to say that this was not done without some pushback uh, from our colleagues in the, in the department in Oxford. And um, uh, and we had some we had some battles over this because uh, they wanted academicians to come in, and uh, George and I were very firm about the fact that we're going to. And since I was in charge of the lecture series, and I had the um, uh, and George Fathar when he was alive supported that notion completely. Um, uh, we we were intent on bringing um, uh, American Indians in to speak, uh, so that they that our students and the community and everybody could have um, a, a better experience and a, um, a more profound experience in that, in that lecture. So I thought that was, that was a good thing that we did. Mm -hmm. In one of my classes, yeah. I asked informally how many students in this room have a Native American ancestor. <laughs> One fourth of the hands went up. Yeah. Was that the case in your day? Yeah, and if you ask what yeah. tribe, it would be Cherokee. Yes. <laughs> and that's, that's, yeah, very common. Yeah. Do you think that's accurate? Well, I think probably it's with some ancestry. It's, it's quite, quite possible. With, uh, as far as being enrolled members in the tribe, no, that's another story. All right, so. 
but I was largely Cherokee, I think, was usually what, yeah. you know, people were, yeah, you know, just trying to think, yeah, that would be it. Let me mention something else that we had on campus here, if I may. Um, you know, we had another, you know, Daryl Baldwin is giving the, uh, who has received the MacArthur Genius Award, and uh, uh, we both have worked with the Miami tribe and continue to work with the Miami tribe on um, many projects. And um, we've had Daryl over here to talk. And, but it's interesting, we had a MacArthur fellow here before. I brought one in, uh, Jason Clay, uh, who was the research director uh, and editor uh, of, um, uh, of Cultural Survival uh, in um, Cambridge, Mass. And Jason was a MacArthur Fellow, and uh, I had him here as a scholar in residence, and uh, he spent uh, a full week here, and you know, between here and Oxford. But uh, and he was the the kind of guru of the rainforest marketing strategy some years ago, All right? So you might have heard of that, and uh, uh, so he was a very prominent. You now he's a, a senior policy analyst for the uh, World Wildlife Fund. So uh, now these are. <laughs> we had an interesting number of people we've brought on campus. This is Middletown, Ohio. Right. We're Steel City. Right. What made you think to reach so high for your speakers? Why not? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's... it's we, we had contacts. We had contacts. We could through our own field work and our own research <laughs> and there was money available to be, bring people in. We did it. We did. And we had large crowds. Mm -hmm. Did that, were the crowds composed only of students? No. We no, had, we it had. was open. How did you accomplish that? Well, <laughs> One thing I think the university, and, it, and it's interesting, it's going to sound kind of crazy, but I mean, it's uh, in large measure, I made a lot of the talks part of the classroom. All right. You know, the problem I think that a lot of university uh, professors have is that if there's a speaker brought on campus, they don't make it necessarily obligatory for their students to show up to it. And that's ridiculous. So you're spending money on and bringing somebody in. The students need to hear it. And I've had students complain about it. And uh, once they were there, they said, wow, so happy, so pleased that I was able to, to be there. And that wasn't all of them, but that, you know. And I think we got the word out, and we, went, and we had a network that we could, we could tap into of friends um, that we could uh, call upon. And, uh, but we really didn't have many problems in getting people into these talks. All right. We also worked with other offices on campus. Right. The public relations office would get an article in the newspaper about a speaker coming and um, At a lot of notices these, around campus. Yeah. I mean, a lot of these speakers, uh, their honorarium was, was way beyond what we had in the, even in the Hanson budget. Uh, now, Winnie LaDuke, I had to, <laughs> I had to, I had to, we really talked it up and uh, to get her to come in on a shoestring for her. And uh, we showed you something of her character, uh, and um, I was there. You know, we made calls all around campus to get money for um, dinner, um, things of that sort. And people would come up. Different departments would throw money yeah. in. You know, we can give you fifty bucks here, give you a hundred bucks here. In some cases, three hundred dollars, whatever. We were able to put it together. Part of the community involvement um, goes to the concept of Midfest. Mm -hmm. Can you comment about <laughs> the campus relationship with the Midfest? Well, I can't comment about <laughs> campus com uh, contact or, or uh, uh, relationship with Midfest. I can only speak from my personal experience. Um, and I was on, I think, one or two steering committees, um, and I and I I dropped out of it um, because I felt that Midfest was. Um, and there's a phrase I want to use here, and I'm trying to think about it. It's, it was a, it was a cultural tourism, mm -hmm. and 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 uh, I think that's the phrase I want: cultural yeah. tourism. Yeah. And I felt that um, some of the countries that they were 
uh, proposing to, to, as a theme for the, had some major league human rights violations, had you know, other issues, environmental issues and so on. And these were not discussed. These were to be not mentioned and so on. And uh, uh, I was uh, patently uncomfortable with that. And that's why I had nothing to do with Midfest after that. Yeah, I, I was not involved in Midfest. But what Dolph was talking about is like understanding Mexican culture by eating a taco. So, is that fair? <laughs> oh, no, that's fair. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the food is an interesting entree into different cultures, mind you. But it doesn't speak. If people are going to understand something about that, uh, we need to be courageous enough to strip away all of the, 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 the touristy stuff and, and get to the, some of the issues that affect all of us at some point. You have to get to how did the food come about, who harvested it, who right. grew it, uh, what kinds of forces are they finding themselves in opposition to trying to remain subsistence farmers and that right. kind of thing. But right, and the level of exploitation that these people are experiencing. and you know, just, it, That did not resonate with me, and I certainly wasn't going to be able to... Um, to change the thinking of the committee and the and the people in Middletown, they were they loved the festival and uh, and they were happy with it and so on. But uh, um, my comments were antithetical to their interest, clearly. All right. So let's talk about how students get into these deeper issues. Did you have your students do research and? at the library, and what kind of relationship did you have with the librarians here? Library research was, the librarians were great. I mean, I, yeah. I didn't, they were very receptive, and they would um, uh, assess students, and I think I, we had them in, come to the classroom a couple of times. I did, I think, to talk about, um, God, if memory serves, I think I had some coming to the classroom to talk about that. Uh, as far as research projects, yeah, students could work on, uh, I'm trying to think. Well, this is, please yeah. understand that we now have students who go to Google and yeah. um, Wikipedia right. for everything. Right. So before these tools, what did students do to do a paper for you, what did you require? I told them to go over to the stacks. I'd, I'd, I'd tell them to go over and find, if they're working on something American Indian stuff, you know, you can look at the card catalog, but find out where the American Indian materials are, right? And park yourself and start wandering back and forth there and look at different works and look at the titles and so on. And uh, you'd be amazed what a wonderful journey that can be. It was for me. I mean, when I was doing a lot of work and so on, I, you know, the card catalogs didn't have all of the information I needed and so on. And uh, uh, but it got the students to get a handle on books and right, reading and so on instead of in front of a computer screen. And um, uh, oddly enough, I mean, you know, George and I talk about this quite a bit. I mean, with with computers and, and all of that wealth of information that's on the web and so on, people ought to be on top of their game and they're not uh, intellectually and knowledge-wise. And uh, I think the computer has made it very easy with um, uh, to look at Wikipedia and Google something and that's it. And well, we see. also encouraged our students to do hands-on research. Mm -hmm go out into the community and talk to people from whatever cultural background they're interested in studying. Right. Um, but we had to be careful about that. Human informed subjects. consent? Informed consent, <laughs> we just signed. What's informed consent? Hmm? That the person who's being interviewed knows what this is about, where it's gonna go, yeah. who's gonna have access to, to it, and who's gonna use it. Okay. All right. Um, so, when you assigned a, a term paper, how many pages was it? How did students produce a term paper without a computer? I, <laughs> well, the, I typed it, but I mean, I, the, 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 
Well, you need to understand, I, I never gave multiple choice exams. Never, ever, even when I was, you know, I taught a lot of courses in Oxford, and even in large classes, the 300, I gave essay exams, all right. Um, and so, a take home, and I did a lot of take home exams, and take home exams basically required students to produce. I'd give them a word max, something of that sort, and they were producing many term papers that way, with appropriate citations and so on. And that's, I thought that was very productive for me and for the students, I thought. I don't know what. Emphasis too on problem solving. Yeah. Not, not memorization of texts. Right. But given a problem, uh, how would you? How would you go about yeah. approaching this? Uh, an American Indian community that is debating having a casino or not. What are the issues? How, how are the different sides perceiving this and what do they see as the future for them? Do they see it as good? Do they see it as bad? And try to put together information that has some context. What is progress in a very general sense? Yeah. You know, those yeah. kinds of questions you can ask. And uh, it's interesting to, to see the students toss that around and, and deal with it. You're presenting these issues to students, many of whom will go into nursing, mm -hmm. information technology. Mm -hmm. um, they may go on to business and commerce. Mm. Uh, some of them have come back and told us they are CEOs and international directors of <laughs> aspects of multinational corporations. Mm -hmm. um, what did you contribute to their education? Holistic thinking. Um, problem solving. Broad uh, perspectives. Broad perspectives. Comparative perspectives. Understanding cultural context. Um, those resonate and work for anybody. In nursing, uh, delivery of health care to people from diverse cultural backgrounds requires some understanding of, of cultural values uh, and customs. Um, business the same way. If you're marketing and you're targeting populations and so on for that, and all this plays out. And the good thing, I think, for our students and both, both George and I are applied ethnographers. We're applied anthropologists. We use anthropological perspectives to solve problems. We weren't interested in um, academic productivity and, and uh, filling journals for its, own sake. for its own sake as an end in itself. Um, but uh, we were interested in the, um, the application of, of our perspectives. And not, in a, not in a way that's directive, but in a way in which communities, people can use those perspectives to build their own capacity to deal with issues without somebody from the outside telling them how to do things. That's a very big difference uh, in terms of the way in which we operate. In our field work, we would generate problems to work on based upon what a community needed. Right. We weren't going to the community and saying, oh, you need to do this. Uh, we were finding out what kinds of problems the community wanted some help with, and those were the sorts of things that we worked on. Yeah, exactly. That seems to be the same kind of approach that our information technology and engineer technology um, has with the business community. Uh, do you see that helping students who went into nonprofit work or government? Oh yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, it's. Uh, I think. Well, big, big uh, future here. I think is that people are so, can be so quick to look at a situation, mm -hmm. and they can solve that problem, without ever asking the people who will be affected by it. Right. How do you see the problem? What do you think needs to be done to resolve this issue? Come from the community and then use anthropological expertise to help them deal with those issues. We're always concerned about who's empowered by what we do. And um, that was, a, that was the yardstick against which we measured our, our work. And we wrote a lot of grants for 
uh, tribal communities and uh, uh, did a lot of land claims work. Uh, we set up an environmental management office in a tribe, um, uh, wrote grants for them at their request and so on. Cultural and, resource uh, management. Cultural resource management. Um, so there's a whole host of things that we were effectively, we were able to, uh, f uh, to do and uh, which in all, in, in, in what we wanted to do was to uh, enable these communities to build their own capacity to handle environmental issues, to protect their cultural resources um, in ways that they wanted to do, not in which we would envision, all right? So that was very important to us, and that's the kind of work we did. I'd like to completely change gears now. All right. Um, we have many stories, but part of the joy of teaching at this campus is socializing with faculty or taking the children to a sporting event or things like that. Um, did you participate in any of these activities that created a community among faculty and staff? Or do you remember any particular events? We had, <laughs> well, there were some uh, uh, basketball games, and you participated in one of those, between Hamilton campus and Middletown campus. We had that going on for a while. Uh, and that was faculty teams, faculty and staff teams against one another. All right, this is before cardiovascular disease came into play. And uh, so we did that. What else? I don't think there was a whole. I don't know. No, you know. I mean, we both you know. live in Oxford, and so there was a little distance problem. You know, if it wasn't happening within the teaching times that we were here. Yeah, I don't think we would probably. Once we left campus, and we had, uh, we I wasn't thinking in terms. Unless I had a field trip, like I mentioned on uh, Saturday, uh, I wasn't thinking about coming back. Wow. So. so, what was worth that long commute? Why did you make that commute for so many years? Didn't think about it twice. I was. I enjoyed my job. I enjoyed doing what I was doing here. You can go over your lecture while you're driving. I mean, that's that's just private time. It was beautiful. I mean, it's uh, uh, it's 40 minutes. I take different routes and so on. No big deal. It, that's. <laughs> I didn't think twice about it. it was just, no, no, it wasn't. It wasn't a, a burden. The next question you do not have to answer, as with all questions. We have many people who have said that they thought that. Oxford looked down on Middletown students. <laughs> I can speak to that. <laughs> what is the Oxford perspective on that perception? Our perspective as being living in Oxford? Yes. Well, I don't, my perspective was always from the point of view of the regional campus, but I taught at both campuses quite a bit, all right? So I was at, I had appointments at both, but. Um, uh, let me explain it this way. I was in University Senate. I was on University Council, a, a representative for Middletown, and also University Senate. And it was at a University Senate meeting that we were talking about something with regard to the regional campus. We were going through this ongoing, uh, continuous ad nauseum debate about the role of regional campuses and so on. And I had one of my colleagues who, uh, she stood up in Senate and said, well, you know that the regional campuses have a deviant mission, all right? And I, yeah, and who later became the Dean of Arts and Science. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I basically let out, I said, what are you talking about? And said, well, you're different. I said, yeah, different is better than deviant. All right, you, you gave us a, you know, a, a pejorative term to describe difference, and you need to understand that, that we are different, and that we are more likely fulfilling the, the mandate, as we see it, and the mission of a state-supported institution to, to take care of all students, all citizens of the state of Ohio. 
Uh, and so my feeling has always been is that uh, Miami Oxford, even you know, as a graduate of the place, right? I mean, uh, has always acted, has acted as a, um, a private institution at the same time being state supported. I've had speakers come on campus and, and they would go over to the Burstein Alumni Center and they said, oh, uh, this is a state supported institution? How can that be? All right. It, it behaves like a private. I mean, talk about being a public ID and, and so on. I mean, that's, that's nonsense. It's a state-supported institution. It should be a democratized education. It's but fun. students from here always felt looked down upon right. when they went to Oxford, and they would avoid saying anything about being a student on the Middletown campus and coming to Oxford to take a course. But there was still... The students in Oxford would pick up on subtle differences mm -hmm. between regional campus and the main campus. And a lot of it has to do with social class right. in ways that people don't usually recognize. Not just money, it's, it's a much broader way of life. We would contend that, that diversity uh, is as much a social and economic issue as it is a cultural and racial issue. And we need to address that university. And that, that was, you know, and, and so in many ways, you know, I've heard university officials say that, uh, you know, you ask a question about, well, what about um, social and economic diversity? And they'll say, well, the Middletown campuses are, or regional campuses are handling that, right? As if Oxford is immune from that contamination. Uh, it's a very insular, um, bourgeois kind of thinking, and it's, it's, you know, it's not good. If you ever wanted to get a discussion going on in a class where students were going to both campuses, <laughs> all you'd have to do is bring up the feelings about how they're treated on this campus, how they're treated in, right. in Oxford, and they'll start discussing. It'll go right, on for a right. while. Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry. The next question that I want to ask, if you could speak to members of the planning committee who came up with the idea for a regional campus here, what would you say to them? Well, I mean, Jim Rhodes, who was governor at the time, had uh, the idea of having a campus within 30 miles of every citizen of the state, I believe, yeah. and I would say, good going, well done. That's a good thing. Have it. I mean, I, that's I said, congratulations. Yeah. You did well. Um, if you could speak to faculty who are hired ten years from today. <laughs> What would you tell them is important to keep in mind when they walk into the classroom? Uh, hmm. What we would tell faculty to keep in mind when they walk into a new faculty, walking into a classroom 10 years from now. Um, don't come in to the classroom with any preconceived notions. Figure it out. Talk to your students and so on, and find out something about them before you proceed. I mean, I've done that in my classes all the time. I know George does that too. Don't you ask, ask questions about um, what they're doing there, what they're about, and so on. And I th find that all very, very useful. So, yeah, that's what I would suggest. I think I would probably just say don't let the technology get in the way of the relationships. Yeah, yeah. That may be a losing battle 10 years from now. It's yeah, already close yeah. to being one. Absolutely. Is there anything else you want to contribute to the record in this interview? <laughs> well, it's been a good experience having taught at Middletown. Uh, I enjoyed my classes, I enjoyed working with the students. Um, and we frequently both will be out somewhere and some student will come walking up and, are you Dr. Esber, are you Dr. Greenberg? 
And it's, it's happened everywhere. Ev everywhere. And, and all, all circumstances, I yeah. can only... And are you hiding from them when they say that? No, or? no, I just, <laughs> but they're asking, they're asking for us to remember and, and, uh, and that's pretty hard after all the, you know, thousands of students we've had, but uh, yeah, I'd say I'd had a, I've had a great career. I, I'd say I enjoyed the, uh, uh, the community very much. I mean, it was university-wide, it's always been a struggle for a number of things, um, and that I think is uh, something I, I, I don't miss. Uh, but uh, the colleagues, the students, the, and special students we've had that have gone forward and so on have been terrific. Uh, the unfortunate thing, I had to share an office with this guy, and I, for some reason, I invited him in, and he never left. So it's like a junkyard dog; he won't go away. <laughs> it was the right thing to do. <laughs> there is a colleague that we talked about before we started mm -hmm. recording, um, uh -oh. and I need a story to go with some other interviews. I need to know about Malcolm Sedan. I don't. I. I never met the man. He was never before my him. time. I met him. I mean, he, Malcolm was um, uh, in the English department, and uh, he was a poet. I think he had just published a book. Um, he was well liked by his faculty, and he was a cordial, nice person. But I did not know him uh, very well. Okay. All right. I appreciate that. All right. Those are all the questions that I have. Any other questions? Do we have any questions, George? Do we learn anecdotes? Oh, we got a lot of anecdotes. <laughs> well, you know, for me personally, working with Dolph, I, I don't like to have this on tape or for him to hear it, but we really have had a wonderful relationship together working on this campus and with American Indian communities in our field work. We work together on a lot of projects. And it was a pleasure to have somebody that I could work so closely with and uh, get along with. You're here for me, yes. and, and I've learned a lot from, from George. And uh, so I've, I've, uh, I've relished our, our uh, partnership. It's been really good.